Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome to today's bill hearings for the House Health and Government Operations Committee. This is a virtual committee meeting, so I ask for your patience if we encounter any technological or streaming issues. This bill hearing is being streamed on the Maryland General Assembly's YouTube channel. Remember, even though we're meeting on Zoom, please adhere to our usual committee rules of one question and one answer from the panel, not one question and one answer from each individual panel. Also, please keep your questions shorter than, ex than um, expected, the, the expected answer. Um, when the basically the bill sponsor or designate is allotted five minutes to present the bill, five um, witnesses will each be allowed to speak for two minutes in support. You receive for the members um, th from Kathy the list of the witnesses um, in your impacts. Um, please stay in the hearing until the delegates have had an opportunity to ask questions um, for the witnesses. Next five witnesses will each be allowed to speak for two minutes in opposition and then respond to questions. Please conclude your remarks when you see the timer finish. We really appreciate that. And members, please remain present with your video camera on during the entirety of the hearing. These are the rules. And please, again, only ask one question of one witness. If you have other questions, you may follow offline. Please use the right hand function to indicate you have a question. We have the actually um, the order of the hearings today. We're going to start with House Bill 49, then on to House Bill 109, House Bill 44, and the last bill of the date will be 178. House Bill 80 has been um, removed. So House Bill 49, Delegate Johnson, titled Public Health Emergency and Allergy Treatment Program, Nurse practitioners, Delegate Johnson, will you be so kind and get started? Thank you, Madam Chairman, Madam My Vice pleasure. Chairman, and members of the committee. I'm happy to be here to introduce House Bill 49, Public Health Emergency and Allergy Treatment Program, Nurse Practitioners. This is a very important bill because it authorizes nurse practitioners to prescribe and dispense auto-injectable epinephrine commonly referred to as an EpiPen, to certain certificate holders who operate youth camps. Nurse practitioners licensed in Maryland have full practice and prescriptive authority, according to the Annotated Code of Maryland statute and the Code of Maryland regulations, the COMAR 10.27.07.02. This allows them to independently practice and prescribe medications. This bill adding nurse practitioners to those able to prescribe EpiPens to youth camps is merely a clarification change. It is important that nurse practitioners, especially those working at youth camps, can prescribe and dispense EpiPens and the related paraphernalia to keep the children in our camps around the state safe. The nurse practitioners can and do currently prescribe epinephrine EpiPens to individuals who have documented life-threatening allergy reactions when exposed to certain environmental or food allergies. Now, it sounds a little confusing. Well, if they can prescribe throughout the state, then what's the problem with prescribing to a youth camp? When they prescribe to individuals, it is just that, to an individual. What we're asking that is that they be allowed to prescribe to a certificate holder to have EpiPens at a summer camp, that if someone needs it from a food allergy, bee sting, a bite, what have you, and it's a life-threatening situation, that they have the EpiPens there at the summer camps to be able to administer the EpiPens by someone who is trained and, and uh, able to do that. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable vote on House Bill 49. With me today are members of the Nurse Practitioner Association of Maryland, who will further elaborate on this very necessary change and answer any specific questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Johnson. We have your first witness is Ms. Lindsay Ward. Are you here? Yes, I am here. You can get started. Okay, thank you. My Good pleasure. afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Ward, and I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner in Anne Arundel County. And I am also the president-elect of the Chesapeake chapter of the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. I am representing our chapter's support of HB 49. We are a professional organization over with over 195 members dedicated to, to delivering quality care to children and families in Maryland. According to the Allergy and Asthma Network, one in 12 children have food allergies and 25% of allergic reactions occur without a previous diagnosis. There are also 150 to 200 annual fatalities from food allergies and 40 fatalities from insect stings. Children may experience one of these severe allergic reactions for the first time while away at camp. Giving epinephrine early is the cornerstone for successful management of an allergic reaction and is essential for survival when a severe anaphylactic reaction occurs. Legally, nurse practitioners are able to prescribe, dispense, and administer epinephrine in several settings, including hospitals, private practices, schools, and daycare centers. Camps need to be included. It is essential that nurse practitioners be added to the legal list of authorized healthcare providers that are able to prescribe, dispense, and administer epinephrine. This bill will protect pediatric patients by increasing access to life-saving medications and save lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Next, we have Mr. Mark Evans. Are you here, sir? Yes, ma'am. You can get started. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, delegates, colleagues, and distinguished guests. My name is Mark Evans, and I am a nurse practitioner as well as a camp health supervisor for several camps in Maryland. Currently, the emergency and allergy treatment program allows a physician to prescribe an epinephrine auto injector directly to a camp. This means that camp staff can use a spare epinephrine, epinephrine auto injector in their first aid supplies, and trained staff can use this life-saving medication if an individual suffers from an un unexpected anaphylactic reaction. Having access to this medication is important because many children will discover they have severe allergies during their first exposure to an allergen at camp. These children will not already have the auto injector on them because they're unaware of these allergies. Without this auto injector being available, a child may not be able to receive life-saving treatment they need in time. Nurse practitioners are capable of prescribing epinephrine auto injectors to individual patients and have been safely prescribing them to patients for many years. Now we need to add nurse practitioners to this bill so we can increase access to this life-saving medication to camps all over Maryland. No child should die because an epinephrine auto injector was not available. No camp should be unable to access an EpiPen because they know a nurse practitioner who could prescribe it, but not a physician. And no, no nurse practitioner should be unable to provide the camp that they supervise with an EpiPen due to the current wording of the emergency and allergy treatment program. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope that you'll consider this very important amend amendment to this bill. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we have Ms. Zoe Weiss. Good afternoon, ma'am, are you here? Hi. Hi, will you please be so kind and get started? Yes. Thank you. My name is Zoe Weiss. I am 16 years old and live in North Bethesda. It is important that I share my story with you. An EpiPen saved my life. I attended the Green Acres camp from age four until I was 12 and returned last summer as a counselor in training, working with three and four year olds. I was outside with the campers in a tent for an activity. All of a sudden, I felt a searing pain where I had been seated. The counselor next to me noticed some bumps and went to get an ice pack. The bumps grew larger and more painful and started burning. Red blotches began to cover my chest and my arms and my neck, and I felt a terrible heat growing inside of me. We rushed to the office, and within minutes, my throat began to close, my chest felt tight, and it became harder and more difficult to breathe. I was going into anaphylactic shock. I had never experienced an anaphylactic reaction before. I had been stung years before without a reaction. I had never needed an EpiPen. 
I was confused and frightened and aware that this was a life-threatening situation. It turns out I had been stung by at least 10 wasp or hornets. The Green Acres staff had an EpiPen on site and administered it quickly under the guidance of Mark Ubens, our Green Acres nurse practitioner. Mark kept me calm and observed the trained staff administer the EpiPen. My breathing while labored did not get worse. Minutes later, the ambulance arrived and they quickly took me to the emergency room at Suburban Hospital. The EpiPen treatment allowed enough time to get me safety, safely to the hospital for treatment. Without Green Acres having an EpiPen on hand, it would have been a very different outcome. It is very important for youth camps to have EpiPens for people like me who have undiagnosed al allergic sensitivities. For this reason, I ask you to support Health Bill 49. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Wise, for sharing your experience. I'm sorry that you had to live through that. We really appreciate your time today. And I just want to say that you're well represented. Your delegate, Delegate Ariana Kelly, sits on this committee and is highly regarded. And so is the uh, sponsor of the bill. Next, we have um, Mr. Josh Howe. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joshua Howe. I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, the Maryland Association for Justice, um, favorable with amendments to um, House Bill 49. Um, part of House Bill 49, there's a legislative immunity um, that would limit a civil cause of action to um, uh, under this bill. And that is outlined on page three, um, beginning on line 27. Um, so if you're familiar with the Maryland Association for Justice, we are um, critical of um, legislative grants for immunity and um, often uh, try to offer amendments to clarify the immunity so that uh, the uh, legislation that, you know, uh, the attempts to help some of these individuals doesn't end up inadvertently hurting them. Um, I'd ask the committee to recall um, a 2018 bill that was um, very similar to this regarding the um, EpiPen program in the use of higher education. Um, there was a bill, Senate Bill 1473, um, it was codified to Chapter uh, 527 of 2018 um, that uh, discusses um, this program, but instead of youth camps, it's in terms of uh, higher education. And there was amendments offered to clarify um, when the immunity could be exercised um, in these certain cases and would call for the appropriate storage and, um, of the, and, and following manufacturer guidelines um, and keeping the EpiPen at appropriate temperature to, uh, to be able to, if they follow that, those procedures, then they would be granted the immunity. This, these amendments, which are in my written um, testimony, uh, simply conform uh, this uh, subtitle 7A to language, I mean, subtitle 7 to subtitle 7A, which is immediately following in the code. And with that, I can, I can answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony today. We really appreciate it. Um, for the members, um, are there any questions? I'm going to start with, also, um, I understand that you're also represented by Delegate Al Carl. Delegate Carl, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for Zoe Weiss. Uh, Ms. Weiss, on a scale from one to 10, how amazing is Walter Johnson High School? It's great. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying that because you were, there's not just one Delegate Kelly, but there are two legislators on here, here who are WJ parents, and you did a great job and we're proud of you. Thank you. Wonderful. So we have Delegate Bagno followed by Delegate Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the bill sponsor for bringing this forward. Um, as, a, as a 22 plus year uh, camp director, I really appreciate this. Um, and just to clarify, um, this doesn't alter in any way the process of, of, of reacting to an emergency where you would administer the EpiPen, you would immediately call emergency services uh, for follow-up, and it doesn't alter the, um, the parental pre-authorization uh, either. Is that correct? Who are you asking the question of? Um, I, I, I was asking it of the, the bill sponsor, but whoever would, okay. they would be most um, qualified to answer. 
Delegate Johnson, will you be so kind and address it if you're um, able? Would one of my panel like to address that, Mark? Possibly. Yes, uh, everything that you stated is is correct. The um, requirement for pre-notification of the availability of the pen, um, the emergency procedures, including calling 911, all uh, remain as part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Thank you, Delegate Johnson. We have um, Delegate Kelly followed by Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and my question is actually also for Zoe. I don't mean to pile on after my colleague, Delegate Cara, but I am so happy to see you here today and so thankful um, that you shared your very important story with us. Um, so I will just give a softball follow-up, which is how does it feel uh, to be here today testifying, knowing that your testimony is gonna help people across the state of Maryland? Very good, especially considering I would like it if that never happened to anybody else because it was terrifying. Thank you so, so much. So sorry you went through that. Yes, yeah, so sorry, but but please know that we heard your testimony and we're, we're very um, thankful for the sponsor for bringing this bill. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Hill. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you everyone who testified. Uh, thank you to the sponsor and especially thank you, Zoe, and I'm um, sorry you went through, but so glad you survived it. Um, Delegate Johnson, have you had a chance to look over uh, Maryland Association for Justice's amendment? Do you, if so, do you have any objections to it? Um, I did look it over. Um, I, but in the in the bill, I did. It does say that um, action may not arise against certificate holder or agent if the certificate holder or agent, in good faith in good faith to administer auto-injectable epinephrine into an individual experiences or believes the certificate holder or agent to be experienced anaphylactics uh, unless the certificate holder or agent conducts amount of gross negligence or willful wanting misconduct or intent intentional uh, torturous conduct. So it's not releasing them totally from, it's not total immunity. And this is already being done by physicians. All we're doing is looking to add the nurse practitioners to be able to uh, render epinephrine EpiPens to um, a camp advisors. Um, Madam Chair, I have a follow-up or? Sure, very quick, please. Okay, very quickly. So it's really the first part of maybe we can follow up in subcommittee, um, it, it seems like the first part will apply the same to anyone, including physicians and pharmacists. And it's just looks like language. And I guess this question is from Mr. Howe that tries to just make sure there are standards that the camp has to follow. Mr. Howe, is that correct? Correct. I think um, this these amendments attempt to define some of the negligence that you know we've identified that could possibly occur and attempt to further define you know, practices to ensure that um, the EpiPen is delivered in the most safe way manageable. And that if those, if, if you know, being able to determine um, the expiration date and the proper manufacturer um, um, guidelines for uh, dispense should be followed. And, and if they're not followed, then, then, we, then the Maryland Association, Association for Justice believes that there should not be a grant of civil immunity. And this also conforms to um, a similar um, statute, um, like I said, regarding uh, this program in higher ed high institutes of higher education. Okay, thank you. And it's not specific to the practitioner. Thank you. Um, if I may, Delegate Johnson, I know I had the, the bill that dealt with higher education and the language that they're asking is in that bill. If I may ask you on behalf of the committee, Will you meet with Mr. Howe and work this out, please? Absolutely, okay. uh, Madam Vice Chairman. We definitely want standards and we wanna make sure that good practices are followed. So we'll be open to discussing his amendment, that's for sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, this concludes the bill hearing on House Bill 49. Next, we have House Bill 109, Delegate Shetty. 
Maryland Department of Health System for Newborn Screening Requirements. Welcome to our committee, and will you please get started? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Chair Pendergrass, Vice Chair Pena Melnick, members of the esteemed Health and Government Operations Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 109, which will help improve the process by which Maryland screens newborn babies for treatable rare disorders, saving countless babies' lives while also saving money to our healthcare system in the process. HB 109 will require that the newborn screening uh, that happens here in the state includes screening for each of the conditions listed in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, or RUSP, within two years of the condition being added to the panel. With this, we will ensure that all newborns in Maryland receive the most updated, comprehensive medical attention that they deserve from the very beginning of their lives. Currently in Maryland, when babies are born, unless the parents choose to opt out, they receive the benefit of a newborn screening test as part of the state's universal newborn screening program, or NBS. The newborn screen is a special test that's used to test babies for 50 serious medical conditions in order to identify babies who have specific disorders before they get sick, and it helps them get treatment as soon as possible. It is the very first test administered to all babies born in this state, and it frequently identifies babies who are sick, who have no prior family history of rare disorders. It does not test for everything. Only 50 conditions, including cystic fibrosis, severe immunodeficiency disorders, the presence of abnormal red blood cells or sickle cell disease, and more. Maryland develops its list of disorders screened from the federal RUSP that is developed by the U.S. Health and Human Services Department. RUSP is a list of disorders that HHS recommends for states to screen as part of their NBS. However, each state utilizes its own discretion on what to screen for. The disorders on RUSP are chosen based on evidence that supports the potential net benefit of screening, the ability of states to screen for the disorder, and the availability of effective treatments. Maryland recently added four additional conditions to our state's NBS program. These diseases began to be screened for in 2019 and screened for disorders that cause progressive muscle weakness, breathing and heart problems, cell enlargement and dysfunction, and abnormal deposits of lipids in the kidneys, heart, and brain. Maryland is also preparing to soon add X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy, X-A-L-D, or ALD. Try saying that one five times fast. It's a condition that primarily impacts the nervous system and, and uh, the adrenal glands. It's unclear when this will occur, however, but I want to note that RUSP has included ALD on its recommendations for eight years. Given that one in every one, uh, 21,000 males born is at risk for ALD, and about half of the female babies born with this condition might develop symptoms, earlier adoption of this disorder as part of the NBS panel is critical and could save countless babies' lives. Through early detection and treatment, many of these conditions can be treated um, and prevent future healthcare expenditures, as well as unnecessary trauma to babies and their families. I've submitted a request to the amendments office for a sponsor amendment to clarify that HB 109 will apply only to core conditions listed on the RUSP, rather than to both core and secondary. This aligns HB 109 with the other six states that have passed similar legislation, which also only included the RUSP core disorders. HRSA defines core conditions as disorders that should be included in every newborn screening program and secondary conditions as disorders that can be detected in the differential diagnosis of a core disorder. With this amendment, it will still be up to MDH to decide on which, if any, secondary conditions they wish to screen for. It will simply require MDH to adopt ALD as part of the Maryland Newborn Screening Test by 2023, and they've already indicated that they plan to do that. It will also establish a predictable timeline for when newly added conditions to the RUSP will be adopted here in Maryland as well. 
in your bill file, you've got testimony and support from MedChi, the American College of Nurse Midwives, Maryland Rare, and patients with rare disorders, including one of our esteemed panelists with us today who will share her personal story of why this program is so important to our state. If I may, Madam Chair, I would like to defer the balance of my time to Ms. Payne should she require it. Thank you, colleagues. I welcome your questions and I respectfully request a favorable report on HB 109. Thank you. Um, there's actually the, why don't we just go ahead and call her? I have here um, Jennifer Payne. Will you be so kind and provide us your testimony? You have two minutes. I don't think you had any time left. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good Thank afternoon. You. Good You're afternoon, welcome. Madam Chair, Vice Chair. My name is Jennifer Payne and I'm constituent of District 13. As ambassador for the greater Maryland rare disease community, I thank you and welcome the opportunity to share my testimony in support of House Bill 109. It is with deep and heartfelt gratitude for the state of Maryland's newborn screening program that I come to you today as an adult beneficiary and among the first diagnosed in the state with the rare genetic disorder, phenylketonuria or PKU in 1973. Thanks to newborn screening, timely diagnosis and early treatment spared me a lifetime of institutional care. Because of my age, only I can offer you living testimony to the power of prevention. With my historical perspectives on growing up in Maryland's PKU program in the early days and speak directly to the legislative impact of this powerful public health policy tool that saved my life and my children's lives. I ask you to reaffirm this commitment with passage of House Bill 109 because preventing devastating illnesses and diseases before they become too serious and too costly to treat benefits all Americans. Early detection and early treatment are critical for the clinical management of PKU. The effects for which the brain and central nervous system are target organs of damage stem from a deficiency or an inability of the liver to metabolize phenylalanine or phe, a building block of protein found in virtually every food. Given my medical history and risk with PKU, knowing the accumulation of phe is also teratogenic to offspring of untreated mothers, I can proudly say my children are all healthy and alive thanks to newborn screening. As I've demonstrated, Maryland's participation in RUSP alignment is critical to saving lives and to ensuring a continuation of these effective health programs. In addition, having the necessary resources available to fund the conditions added to RUSP is as equally critical for they impacted our family with dire and direct consequences. Speaking professionally and personally, when it comes to public health, the mission we share is one and the same. It comes down to saving lives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony this afternoon. We appreciate it. Next, we have Mr. Scott Tiffin. Is he here? Yeah, I'm here. You can get started, sir. Good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Scott Tiffin. I'm primarily here to support Every Life, who you'll hear from next, uh, the College of Nurse Midwives, who's also on the panel. Just wanted to be on in case there's any questions I could help answer. Um, did want to flag one thing that I think is important, you know, maybe helpful to the committee about this bill, which is that over the years, this committee has heard several bills to add like specific dis disorders to the Maryland screening. You know, this will kind of streamline the entire process and not have to have advocates come to ask for specific disorders to be added via legislation. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to help answer. Thank you. We appreciate it. Next, we have. Dylan Simon, are you here, Madam sir? Chair. Yes, I am here. Good uh, afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee uh, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Dylan Simon. I'm from the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan-based organization dedicated to empowering the rare disease patient community to advocate for impactful science-driven legislation and policy that advances the equitable development of and access to life-saving diagnoses, treatments, and cures. Uh, and a core part of the diagnosis portion of our work is newborn screening. Uh, and so I come here and speaking to you of this legislation uh, that has, as Delegate Shea noted, has passed in six previous states. Uh, again, I want to keep the focus today on the advocates and supporting them. Uh, so similar to Scott, I am here mostly to help answer questions about the legislation uh, and want to provide the rest of my time uh, for the advocates uh, to provide their testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Catherine Salam. Greetings. Good afternoon. Yes, 
Re um, greetings to everybody. Um, I'm, my name is Catherine Salam. I'm a certified nurse midwife and I'm the vice president of the American affiliate of the American College of Nurse Midwives. And I'm a longtime member of our legislative committee. I speak in support of HB 109 um, to advocate that to advocate that requiring the disorders recommended by the US Department of Health and Human Services are added to the state screening panel within two years. I am a retired clinician, having practiced in Baltimore City for many years at Maryland General Hospital, and then at Chase Brexton Health Services with privileges at Sinai Hospital of Baltimore. In prenatal exam and postpartum hospital rooms, I have had many opportunities to counsel patients and families about newborn screening tests and the benefits of early detection of genetic conditions for which treatment can prevent long-term adverse medical consequences for the infant. Even though some of these are rare diseases, if your infant is affected, the incidence is 100%, as you have just heard from, uh, from Jennifer, our first testifier. You may be familiar with nurse midwifery practice, but believe that once we catch the baby, we're no longer involved in the care. However, our core competencies include care of the newborn for up to 28 days of life, including testing and screening according to local and national guidelines and health education specific to the needs of the neonate and family. In the community setting, birth center and home birth, this may include collecting the specimens, sending them to the state lab and receiving the results. Therefore, having the full federal parent panel available to parents supports our practice as well. I am also, oops, that's it for me. I urge your support, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, we appreciate it. We have Ms. Claudia Fennell. Yes, hello, um, thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Fennell and I'm a parent to an eight-year-old girl with a rare neurodegenerative genet genetic disorder called Batten disease type CLN2. Our family is located in Bethesda, and I'm here to express my urge of support for House Bill 109, aimed to align the MDH newborn screening program, as you just heard with the federal ROSP recommendations, um, to ensure that when a condition is adopted to the ROSP, Maryland families then experience the life-saving benefits of a timely diagnosis. I support this bill personally because diagnosis at birth has the ability to completely transform the lives of bat disease families at this point in history. Penelope was a healthy child, completely asymptomatic until she was three years old. She played and joked with her two siblings, loved soccer and playing in the mud. Um, then suddenly she developed intractable seizures, lost her ability to walk, and most of her, her ability to speak and eat. It was extremely difficult to find a diagnosis, um, delaying treatment when every week counted but eventually we had answers. She started an enzyme replacement therapy, which um, dramatically slows the progression of her disorder. So untreated, she would have almost certainly passed away by now and earlier treatment could have completely changed the course of the disease. Um, the effects of the delayed diagnosis permeate every aspect of our lives. Um, I'm an, unable to return to the workforce because of the complexity of her care um, and uh, it limits a lot of our ability to participate in our community. Um, our story is not unique among pediatric rare disorders. So um, I urge you to support House Bill 109 in order to allow families timely access to critical advances in treatment and reduce the financial impact on families. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Fennell, for uh, sharing your personal testimony. I want you to know that the committee appreciates it. We do have some questions. The first one is Delegate Bill Castro, followed by Delegate Carr, followed by Delegate Semple Hughes. Delegate Bill Castro. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Delegate Shetty. Thank you for bringing this bill forward. You did a great job painting the picture that early detection um, is important for, for it, it can potentially save money, but also more importantly, save lives. My question for you is, do you have any data that you can point to from other states that demonstrates the potential impact on state spending um, if we are able to detect these rare conditions earlier? Thank you, Delegate, for that great question. I really appreciate you and the committee's work in this space. Um, so yes, we did collect some data um, to support uh, the need for um, bills like this um, that can really help um, bolster our state's early detection efforts. And um, what we found is that every dollar that California spends on tandem mass spectrometry, um, their, um, their newborn screening program actually yielded a benefit of $9.32 in the cost avoided. We also have um, significant um, additional uh, research in general that shows that um, early diagnosis via for SCID, a different, um, a different rare disorder, can actually um, yield a significant benefit because if, um, if the infant is um, given a bone marrow transplant within the um, first like 3.5 months of age, they can actually um, save over $2 million to the state's Medicaid program. So uh, the bone marrow transplant by comparison costs $100,000. So, a, you know, a, a pretty significant cost savings on that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Next we have um, Delegate Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Delegate Shetty, for bringing this bill. My question is, have you contacted the Health Care Commission for their feedback on this issue? Yes, thank you, Delegate. I appreciate the question. Uh, we did reach out to them to see if they had any thoughts, um, and they indicated to us just today in writing that this is beyond the scope of legislation that they typically weigh in on. However, they are monitoring the legislation as it moves forward. Hopefully moves forward, knock on wood. Thank you. Delegate Semple Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate Shetty, for the um, bill you have presented for today. So my question is kind of along the lines of the cost, but then also the um, long-term care piece. Um, I've been speaking um, a, a quite a bit during the interim with the sickle cell community, and I know you referenced that in your presentation here today. Um, and so is there, and Ms. Salem may be the one to answer this, but beyond that 28 days of life of working uh, with the infant and the family, is there the benefit of connecting them with community resources um, in uh, the communities? Because there are programs that are um, um, up and running now through John Hopkins and some you know, jurisdictions of the state, but nonetheless is working with the sickle cell community to ensure that they have that continuum of support, but at the same time, getting that helps save our state you know, funds and uh, resources and getting those to the family. So it's kind of like a twofold here. I just wanna make sure that there's long-term consistency there um, to address this, this issue as you brought forth today. Thank you, Delegate. Do you have a preference on who you would like to answer? I could give you kind of a policy and I think you might have better uh, on the ground answer from our practitioners. If I could take from the practitioner, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. All right. thank, thank you for that question. And that certainly is an important aspect. And I, I think it um, leads us into the ideal of con um, comprehensive care from all members of the community. So um, as a provider of prenatal care, uh, especially with um, populations at higher risk for sickle cell disease, which as you know, in inner city Baltimore, there's quite an extensive population who is at risk. So we offer prenatal screening for the diagnosis to the woman. And if she's positive then to her partner, and then refer the couple for um, prenatal genetic counseling. So we've already set in motion um, the process for screening and counseling and decision-making for the family. Um, it, in terms of after the birth, that's where the interdisciplinary team care comes in. 
and certainly we would want to involve the um, pediatric nurse practitioner or the pediatrician in um, seeking out resources for the family. But you're right, it's very important to have a seamless system in place at all stages, both pre and after um, birth for the child. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Next, we have Delegate Lewis Young, followed by Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome. I'll address my question to the bill sponsor. Um, have you reached out to the Maryland Advisory Council on Hereditary and Congenital Disorders? Because that group deals exclusively with what disorders should be tested on, and they get a lot of um, national experts on the disorders and um, information from other state best practices? Um, I will have to, if you don't mind, defer to some of our panelists here who have assisted in some of the outreach, if that's okay. Um, I'll help Delegate Shetty, if thank that's you. okay. Yep. Yeah. yep, so we're working with Delegate Shetty's staff. We have reached out to the council. Uh, we've reached out through the health department um, and are working to try to set up a meeting. Um, we were told by the health department that getting that meeting scheduled was gonna probably be a little delayed uh, because of the cybersecurity uh, breach they had, but we are still working on getting that set up. Um, thank you for that. And I will email a contact because I was the house's liaison Perfect. to that council for about four years. And so I'm just concerned that you're aligned with their efforts and vice versa. But um, I will get the information of who coordinates that group directly to Delegate Chevy. Thank you, Delegate. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. This is such a great committee. It's such um, a committee. Delegate Lewis Young, thank you. Next, we have Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Delegate Shetty, for bringing this bill to us. Uh, early detection is definitely key. And whoever's best to answer this question, please. Um, I thought that Maryland was already following the U.S. guidelines for uh, infant screening for rare diseases. Uh, and if so, how does this bill differ from what we're already doing? Um, so I could I could try and take a stab at it, but if others wanted to add anything, I might miss if that's okay. I don't want to go against committee guidelines here, though. So only one person, please. Okay. Um, does uh, Scott? Would you like to answer? Yeah, I'm happy to try to answer. Okay. Um, so the way it works now, you know, the feds make recommendations. They create a panel of recommendations, and then every state can. I don't want to say pick and choose, but they can, you know, choose when to add those disorders to their list. Uh, in Maryland, we have added almost all of the core dis disorders except for one, um, and that that's been kind of sitting out there for several years as a federal recommendation. We don't have it in Maryland. Um, you know, this the state has never not adopted a federal recommendation, so we're really just talking about the timeline. We've always ultimately made the decision to add a disorder. And so this bill just says that decision needs to be made within two years and start screening these kids, you know, within two years. Um, so I hope that helps answer the question. It does. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My pleasure. Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you so much for your testimony today. This concludes the bill hearing on House Bill 109. Next, we have House Bill 44, Delegate Holmberger. And Riley, the Maryland Medical Assistance Program, Emergency Service Transporters Reimbursement. And we have with us the members of the Appropriations Committee, Delegate Resnick, Maggioni, and Delegate Henson. Welcome to the ACO Committee. Will you please get started, Delegate Holmberger? Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair and distinguished guest uh, from the other committee there. Uh, you, you may remember this bill from previous years. Uh, for the record, Delegate Kevin Hornberger on HB 44. Uh, this bill seeks to raise the amount of reimbursement for those folks that uh, pick up, 
EMS, uh, drive the ambulance, et cetera. And it seeks it for a smaller subset of that, of that population. And usually those are occupied by our volunteer firehouses, volunteer EMS, or in some cases they might be a municipality that's running the service or a county. Uh, this fee has not been touched in over a decade. It's currently at $100. And uh, if you think about it, it, it's a tremendous amount of paperwork and oversight to recoup that hundred dollars. And this reimbursement is generally for folks that when the, that the EMS provider comes out there, it's determined that they don't have health insurance. Uh, and, and that's, so that really eats into the overhead. And generally this is subsidized uh, with taxpayer dollars to offset these funds. There's also a component in this bill, if you take a look at the amendment which we provided, that deals with the ability uh, to have telehealth, uh, which is to say that when the EMS arrives on site, they can, they can basically use a phone, use a device to call up a more qualified health professional, and that they can administer health care via telework. Uh, when this bill was originally introduced, it was pre-COVID, and that was kind of seen as a novel idea, but now it's critically important. Uh, the, the last component of it is what we call a TNT, which stands for treat but not transfer. So the idea here is that someone calls 911, EMS comes out, uh, they are able to treat the patient there, triage them, and they do not have to transport them to a hospital or to a mental health facility. They currently don't get reimbursed for that. And the reason that's so important that they do is because that Overdose is administering of Narcan is the number one use of that service, and we want to make sure that if they're providing that, that they're re that they are reimbursed. So that's a high level view of the bill. I have a number of advocates that are here to testify and are more well versed on the subject than I am, and I just wanted to thank um, my colleague and district mate Delegate Riley for co-sponsoring this bill with me. We do have a cross file in the Senate. And uh, we could have got her passed last year, but just ran out of time. So hopefully the committee can take a good look at it and get it moving. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Delegate. We appreciate your testimony. So your first witness is going to be Mr. Tom Cole. Good afternoon, sir. Are you here? I am. Good afternoon. Will you please get started? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today in support of House Bill 44. My name is Tom Coe, the Fire Chief and Division Director for Fire and Rescue Services in Frederick County. Additionally, I'd like to note that you've, you have the written testimony of Frederick County, Jan, uh, Frederick County Executive Jan Gardner in your packet today. The last update to the EMS transport reimbursement rates within the Maryland Medical Assistance Program occurred several years ago. And in the ensuing decades, Maryland's emergency medical services have been called on at increasing rates and respond to situations of greater complexity. EMS crews and the medical care they provide have played a growing and important role in providing on-site medical care to patients and in transporting patients to care facilities even beyond the standard hospital emergency rooms. This level of activity requires that we operate at the highest level of readiness in order to support a high level of medical care which requires constant inspection and testing of equipment and staff training. So integral and important to healthcare and healthcare access are EMS services. The provision of emergency medical services in Maryland now includes specialties that ensure the provision of patient-centered care while mobile resources in their home. This group has garnered a name reflective of their key role, mobile integrated healthcare. In addition to providing this care, as we have done traditionally over the last 22 plus months, we have also risen to the challenge of providing response during a historic global pandemic. In providing this mobile integrated health care, EMS has played a critical and much needed proactive role in keeping our residents safe during the pandemic. As one example, our EMS crews have vaccinated over 2,000 homebound seniors against COVID-19. It's just these kinds of services that underscore the challenging needs of communities and challenges to the healthcare system, which must be met by adequate funding for the traditional operations of our EMS service. Thank you, and I urge a favorable report for House Bill 44. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Ms. Hannah Dyer. Good afternoon, ma'am. Is she here, Richard? 
I did not see her. Okay, great. We'll go on to Theodore Delbridge. Delbridge. Um, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Ted Delbridge, Executive Director for MEMS, the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services System. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. House Bill 44 proposes two important steps. First, it recognizes the value of care provided by emergency medical services, EMTs, and paramedics, regardless of whether the patient is taken to a hospital. The current prerequisite for payment for Medicaid that the patient is taken to a hospital indirectly incentivizes EMS agencies and their personnel to take patients to the most expensive place, which is often resource constrained. House Bill 44 helps to right that wrong, providing Medicaid payments when the right care is provided, including when such care obviates the immediate need to go to an emergency department or when transport to an urgent care center or other alternative would suffice. Second, it begins a slow process to update the rate EMS has paid for the services it provides. The current payment of $100 has been the same for more than 20 years. House Bill 44 proposes a series of incremental increases that will still take years to overcome the inflationary erosion of the value of a $19.99. In this regard, which HB 44 proposes is incredibly modest. The fiscal and policy note you received makes mention of the emergency service transporter supplemental payment program. I'd like to provide some additional clarification, hoping that you don't incorrectly conclude that HB 44 is not needed. The supplemental payment program is a cost recovery program whereby the federal government reimburses public agency tax dollar supported Medicaid providers for its share, which is 50% of the difference between the Medicaid, uh, the payment Medicaid offered and the actual cost of delivering the services. While 14 of Maryland's 28 jurisdictional EMS operational programs are participating, none have yet to receive any funds from it. Moreover, the program currently benefits mostly urban and suburban jurisdictions. It does not currently benefit EMS agencies in Garrett, Washington, Carroll, much of Harford, Cecil, Charles, St. Mary's, Calvert, Kent, Somerset, Wicomico, or Worcester counties. It is appropriate that this body recognizes the value EMS provides in maintaining the health of communities, including Medicaid, be Medicaid beneficiaries. Uh, MEM supports HB 44 and requests a favorable report. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Mr. Michael Sanderson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Chair and committee members. Michael. I'm Michael Sanderson with the Maryland Association of Counties. Um, happy to be here uh, supporting this bill, thankful for the sponsor. We had a number of county officials who have submitted written testimony but weren't able to get a time slot for today's hearing, so I'm gonna carry some of their water as well. This is one of MACO's legislative initiative bills for the session. It's a matter of major consequence for essential services all across the county spectrum. Um, I think you already heard from the sponsor and other supporters, so I'll just try and um, put it into, into a little context. Back in the 90s, Maryland created this law and basically said at the time, you know, the thing that an ambulance does is it takes you to the hospital. So that's what we reimburse ambulance companies for. But today we're smarter and we're better trained, we're more responsive, and we realize that mobile care is an important part of, of, of health services for lots of our residents and constituents. Um, this isn't a COVID bill, but the pandemic, I think, underscores the case for everything that's in this bill and the amendments that you've received from the sponsor. The hospitals are saying, please go to urgent care if that will work for what you need. Um, our EMT companies are saying, we're gonna deliver care on site to minimize people's exposure to COVID at confined places like hospitals. Um, if you're concerned about health equity as you ought to be, the idea of bringing care like mobile integrated health through, through emergency care um, to places that are underserved by traditional health care, this is a smart thing to be doing that's left out of the way we do things today. What this bill says with the amendments before you, Maryland should get up to speed. We should support our front lines, set the standard through Medicaid, private insurance will follow, and we're going to do right by an awful lot of Marylanders on this important kind of medical care. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Thank you for your testimony. We have two people that signed up from the Maryland Association of Counties. I understand that Mr. Dominic Bashko is not here, but Ms. Laura Price is. Ms. Price. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Laura Price and I'm president of the Maryland Association of Counties and a councilwoman for Talbot County. I'm here today to request the committee to find HB 44 favorable with amendments. Just last week, Talbot County EMS issued a joint press release along with many other counties pleading with the public to only call 911 in cases of two emergencies. The Eastern Shore is now experiencing what the metropolitan areas have for many years. 
Our average wait times from arrival at the hospital and to our EMS professionals can hand over patient care as averaging 45 minutes and at times has been three hours when normally it would be 10 minutes. And to make matters worse, we're funding our emergency medical services with a reimbursement rate that severely underfunds our actual costs. HB 44 would ensure that the state is reimbursing that critical function of EMS at a fair and modernized rate, one that is responsive to this current health crisis and our future challenges. It would allow for mobile integrated health, allow for billing of treatment in the field that mirrors the transport reimbursement, and allow for transport to other appropriate locations such as an urgent care facility. I have always been extremely supportive of emergency services and have witnessed the treatment given to loved ones. But until you experience it for yourself, you can't fully appreciate just how knowledgeable our EMTs and paramedics are. This happened just last month when 911 was called for me. I was in awe at how much medical care was given to stabilize me before we ever left the driveway. Though I was transported to an ER, it's imperative that we have the capability to compensate these true health professionals for treatment in the field. Under our current system, that doesn't happen and this needs to change. Members of the committee, we must act now to ensure that when you or your family call 911, our EMS can respond in time. And for these reasons, MAKO is asking that you find HB 44 favorable with the amendments that have been discussed. And I'm happy to answer any questions along with our executive director, Michael Sanderson. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Price, for sharing your story. I'm glad you're doing um, better. Um, we appreciate it. Next, we have a uh, favorable with amendment, Mr. Stephen Wentz. Is he here? Mr. Stephen Wentz. Madam Vice Chair, I think he Commissioner Wants had hoped to be here, but I don't believe he got an invitation to join the Zoom room. So I think I believe he's written written testimony, but extends his support as well. That sounds. Thank you so much for letting us know. We appreciate it, and the committee will read the testimony. We read what comes in orally and written, so we appreciate it. Um, and I will call one last time, Ms. Hannah Dyer. I don't see her here. Are there any questions for this? Um, this bill, I'm going to start first with Mr. with Delegate Morgan, followed by Delegate Henson. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Uh, my question is for uh, Ms. Price. Um, what do private insurances, like small group, large group, self-insured, do they reimburse for transportation? They do. Um, I know our county, uh, we're about an 86% reimbursement rate. We do really excellent. The national average is about 70%. And I believe that the problem here is Medicaid. Um, and while this bill has nothing to do with insurance, if the state recognizes Medicaid, so we can only uh, bill the insurance company if it's transported to an ER. And if uh, this changes and Medicaid recognizes that uh, um, transport to other urgent care facilities or treatment in the field, we would also then be able, our emergency services would then be able to build those insurance companies from the way I understand it. What about Medicare? Is that, do they pay for transportation? For transport? Medicare, of course, would be our seniors and Medicaid. Yes. Everybody, but I might punt that over to Executive Director Sanderson. Yes. Um, Delegate, I think how this works in virtually every state is Medicaid basically creates the framework. Private insurance and Medicare follow suit. So basically, you're leading the way with this bill by, by defining these things as reimbursable under Medicaid. Um, this, would, this would catch the insured community. And we don't pursue bills against people who are underinsured or uninsured. So... Uh, Got it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Next, we have Delegate Henson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm trying to address what I see in the letter of information from the Department of Health and better understand the effectiveness or non-effectiveness of the ESPP, the Supplemental Payment Program. I believe one of the panelists addressed it and stated that those payments weren't making their way to Garrett County, Washington, Somerset, Worcester County. I'm trying to better understand why that's not happening and why we're not having success with that program. Well, so who's, who's the best person to answer, Mr. Delbridge? 
Yeah, if I might, please. Um, it's not it's not that we're not having success with the program. First of all, it's brand new and nobody has had the opportunity to receive any payments whatsoever. But the jurisdictions that I listed, the way their emergency medical services system is constructed, they don't qualify to participate, meaning their services aren't run by the county as a whole uh, and or they don't bill Medicaid currently. And so they're not eligible to participate uh, or in some cases, determined that the cost of participating, because there's quite a bit of uh, cost and um, logistical support that needs to occur, they didn't feel that it was worth their while. So is it a, a, a lot of private providers that are, that are commercial businesses no. or? No, it's like volunteer fire departments, uh, EMS agencies that are uh, attached to a volunteer fire department that uh, are not administered by the county as a whole. Uh, they don't benefit. Okay. Delegate Henson. Okay. Wonderful. We have Chairman Pendergrass followed by Delegate Johnson. You're muted. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Madam Chair. Um, this was a good point to follow up uh, Shanika's question, actually. The, the department, the health department, weighed in with all of the costs that this was going to be. They want us to be very aware of how much it will cost the state um, to pay for this. Um, th this is awkward that they do not take a position on bills, but give us what seems to be a hint at what they want. Um, I think it would be very important for the advocates, in particular MACO, to be sitting down and having a conversation with the department because the department implements these programs. The department should be a part of the process and sometimes it's difficult to engage them. So I would be grateful if you would sit down with the department and get them to work on this issue to make things work for everyone. If, if I may, Madam Chair. Please respond to that. Uh, no, I'm going to ask Michael to respond to that, Delegate Hornberger. Uh, heard loud and clear, Madam Chair, and we will pursue that immediately. It won't be the first outreach, but I, I think we're, we're, we're happy to continue to work. Thank you. That, that's the answer that I need. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. Next, we have Delegate Johnson, followed by Delegate Kerr. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, delegates, for bringing this bill and wish this had gotten through last year. Um, so we're talking about a 20-year-old fee of $100. Uh, whoever's best to answer this question. Uh, we talk a lot about the uh, expansion of services that the MS provides, but just to break it down to simp just a, kind of a simple um, understanding, how much ballpark has an ambulance alone increased the cost of an ambulance in 20 years from uh, an ambulance 20 years ago to today. Who's the best person to answer that question? One person, please. Yeah, I can go ahead and tackle that. Uh, Thank the you. Cost, the cost is really exponential depending on what occurs when that patient is, is picked up. And, um, you know, over the years- even oh, I'm sorry, I'm years, sorry, I'm sorry, delegate. I, let me interrupt you. I meant the actual cost of the vehicle. Yeah, that's what I was getting ready to say. The, okay, I'm sorry. The, cost of, the cost of the vehicle now is anywhere between uh, $500,000 and $700,000. So these vehicles in the, in the 90s were, you know, $75,000, $100,000. They, they have a life expectancy. And then they have new regulations that they have to meet with uh, in terms of upgrades. So it's not something that we can just keep reusing over and over again. Uh, and those costs are, are being borne by the taxpayer. Um, it's just in a roundabout way. So you have county governments funding those, you have volunteer dollars, you know, chicken dinners, et cetera. So this cost is all being absorbed right now. Uh, it's, just, it's just in a different way. And this will allow those volunteer fire companies, et cetera, to keep their head above water and not go under. I mean, we've had to cut jurisdictions in Western Maryland that have already succumbed to this and closed up shop. Uh, Hancock, Maryland's a perfect example. So, um, so yes, they have it. They have increased exponentially, and this will do enough to keep them above water. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My pleasure. I have Delegate Kerr followed by Delegate Bagno. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate um, Hornberger, um, thanks for your continued work on this bill that's obviously of great importance to my, to my county, Frederick County, as evidenced by Chief, Goh's, Chief Coe's presence here today and the written testimony by our county executive. Dr. Delbridge mentioned that the reimbursement only occurs if the patient is transported to an emergency department. And we know that emergency departments are overwhelmed even in the best of times, and these are not the best of times. But when I look at the fiscal note, it only uh, takes into account the increased expenditures uh, that would occur, but it doesn't take a look at the, at the potential savings to emergency departments. Does anyone on your panel have any, any idea of the savings that may be realized if, um, by, by the decreased transport to emergency departments? Yeah, I, I defer to the panel on that. It's just so hard to capture these costs uh, because we don't know when the patient doesn't come there what the savings would have been. I, if um, Mr. Sanderson wants to elaborate on that. Um, go ahead, Mr. Mr. Sanderson. Thank you very much. I'll just be brief. I think I think you're exactly right. Um, it probably tests the limits of your professional staff who are excellent to try and get into that level of conjecture. But you're right to connect the dots that for every person who has a broken ankle or uh, some the sort of thing that can be treated at urgent care quickly and more cheaply than at the emergency room, this is going to be a net savings rather than a net cost. Even though you know it's this is billing for B in addition to A, there's definitely some washout in there, and you're exactly right to point that out. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure, Delia Bagno. Thank you, Madam Chair, and and thank you to the bill sponsors for bringing this forward. I, I think this question is actually for Mr. Delbridge. Um, I just want to circle back with you were talking about how this isn't something that uh, rural communities are utilizing because of of um, a difficult process in getting qualified. It, in, in light of that, do we need to look at potentially streamlining that process and what would be the impact of that for rural communities? Do you, do you foresee more of an uptake as we're looking at um, uh, the, 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 um, the reimbursements? Well, um, I'm trying to make sure I'm clear. So the, the emergency service uh, transporter supplemental payment program takes advantage of a federal uh, effort to offset the cost compared to what Medicaid actually reimburses. Um, we, Maryland Medicaid, the, uh, our colleagues at the Department of Health spent a lot of time working with us uh, to determine how many jurisdictions we could qualify to participate in the program. Um, some of the limitations in the rural communities have to do with just how the emergency medical services system is constructed there, how it's put together, who, who's operating which parts and how they bill or, or don't bill. Um, it, is, it is true that some structural changes over the course of time would, would make more of them available to, eligible to participate, uh, but those are longer range uh, projects. And, um, and it, it doesn't offset the need to provide reimbursement or compensation for what the bill sponsors uh, envision in terms of uh, providing payment for things other than conveying somebody to a hospital emergency department, which is all the emergency service supplemental payment program does. It, it, it makes the jurisdiction uh, calculate what the cost of taking Medicaid beneficiaries to emergency department is uh, over the course of time. Uh, so there's a ton of accounting that, that is involved and then they calculate how many patients they actually took to an emergency department and come up with a calculus of how much the federal government owes them. Um, essentially, it, it begs the question, if the federal government is stepping up to um, provide its, its share, its 50%, why would the state not contemplate a similar kind of action and, and do it in, in terms broad, like the bill sponsor suggests, uh, paying for more than just taking somebody to an emergency department, but providing the care that, that they do all the time, whether it results in somebody going to the emergency department or not. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very thorough answer. And, and thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. I would encourage Mr. Delbridge and Mr. Sanderson to meet with the department as the chairman um, requested. Any other questions from our ACO members or our um, colleagues from appropriations? Let me just take a quick look. 
I don't see any. I just want to thank the, oh yes, Del Chair. Delegate Robin Lewis. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Delegate Hornberger for bringing the bill and all the panelists. It, it, this, it's important, um, healthcare access sometimes means being able to transport people to their regular doctor visits, uh, as well as emergency care. I'm thinking about the impact, the healthcare outcomes that are resulting from the lack of funding for emergency transport. I'm just wondering, knowing, for example, that we're in a pandemic, that people are having emergency health needs, knowing that the state of Maryland is also still in the grip of an opioid crisis and that people all over our state are succumbing um, to the ravages of, of opioid, uh, uh, opioids and um, fentanyl in particular, and also knowing that we are currently contemplating a settlement with the makers of um, opioids. We had a, a briefing the other day with A.G. Frosch about it, so that we, there, there may very well be some funds flowing to the state, to all the jurisdictions, to, to basically compensate us for the harm done by that industry. Uh, and I'm just wondering, first, do we know how many people in the affected counties, in Garrett and Kenton and the other places, how many people there are losing their lives or having poor health outcomes directly due to the lack of emergency medical transport. It might be helpful to know that. Um, and then secondly, has there been any thought to building out a more routine mobility service in the counties? The Maryland Transportation Administration offers mobility. It's a uh, special transport for medical care uh, in areas that, that MTA serves. What about in the counties that don't have that and that really need it? Whoever's best to answer those two questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to take a stab at both of those um, very important questions. Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, drug abuse issues, especially in my county and Cecil County, because we are along that 95 corridor, even though we're a rural county, we've seen a massive influx of, of drug use overdose um, tied to uh, tied to heroin, fentanyl. Uh, our overdose rates uh, for many years surpassed or were the same as Baltimore City. So a, a lot of the issues that we're having in the rural parts of Maryland are no different than the urban parts. However, that treatment, that ability to come out there and uh, distribute Narcan, et cetera, it's being delayed. And those folks are, are suffering more damage because they can't get that quick access to healthcare. And I'll tell you, I, I don't want to I don't want to sit here and bash private ambulance companies. We need them. They're an integral part of delivering people to the hospital. But some of these companies aren't as good as actors as others. They're doing things like running insurance checks before they come out. They, they, they know the population. They know the addresses. So if there's a call from a certain area at a certain time, I'm delayed. It's going to be two or three hours. They push that on to the, the local EMS, which is provided by a firehouse or the community, because they know they're not going to make money on it. And that even further delays the response time. And we're not getting health care equity for these low income neighborhoods and for the folks that are suffering with substance abuse. So that's why a bill like this is so important in going to save lives and save money. In terms of the transportation that you spoke about for routine, we not only want to we not only want to expand that out into the rural areas, uh, we don't have to have a full ambulance to be able to do that. We can transport that person in a van uh, at a lower cost when they identify that it's a mental health issue, for example, or that they don't need medical treatment, they just need transportation. But this is the first step to be able to do that because it allows you to deliver someone to a mental health facility, to a doctor's appointment, to a general practitioner. And, uh, you know, I've, I'm very passionate about this bill. I've been working on it for, for over three years. And uh, this, is, this is going to go a long way in making sure that low-income residents and those communities can get the same access that everyone else is. So fantastic question, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. My pleasure. I don't see any other questions. So this concludes the bill hearing on um, House Bill 
44. I just want to thank the members of the Appropriations Committee for joining the ACO Committee today. Have a great Thanks afternoon. Thanks so much for having me, Elf. You're welcome. For the ACO Committee, we have one more bill, um, and we have House Bill 178, Delegates Chan and Krim, Public Health Cottage Food Businesses Annual Revenues. Good afternoon, Delegate Chan. Will you please get started? Thank you very much, Madam My Chair day. Pendergrass, and also Madam Vice Chair Penya Melnick and the members of the Health and Governance Operations Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present House Bill 178 on behalf of Delia Krim and myself. And this is an introduction of the bill from last year. What it does, it would increase the annual revenues that cottage businesses can make in a given year from 25,000, which is the current limit, to $100,000. And especially now more than ever during the pandemic, this bill would really help a very fast part of our state's economy because of many small businesses and cottage businesses operating from their homes. We've seen a great demand for these types of products. And the $25,000 limit currently set is a, it's actually a barrier. And oftentimes that many of these small cottage businesses are actually hitting those limits or getting very close to those limits. So $100,000 Raising that limit will be an incremental step to allowing these companies to be able to grow their businesses and also to help contribute more to our state's economy. And also with inflation due to the rising cost of goods and also the supply chains, these cottage businesses are also having these challenges and raising the limits would also help with regards to them too. There's a lot of pride in this community, in the cottage business, and also safety is the, of the utmost concerns. And the parameters that they do have right now is that all the packages that are produced, they actually have labels on them and the name of the company and the address. And if they actually sell it in the retail store, there's additional information that's put on there by an identifier. That's what the bill is about, and we appreciate your consideration of a favorable vote this session. And joining us this afternoon, we have several of the cottage business owners across the state joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Delegate. We appreciate it. Our first witness favorable panel is Mr. Thomas Giancola. Are you here, sir? I am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chairs and distinguished committee members. My name is Tom Giancola and I'm a home baker operating a cottage food business I would like to ask for your support for House Bill 178. I've been trying to grow my business for the past two years, but unfortunately, the restrictive revenue cap prohibits me from doing so. I specifically had to turn down opportunities to sell my bread at additional farmers market events and other places in my community, and had to decline offers to partner with other local businesses. This has delayed my expansion goals because I'm easily able to reach the revenue cap by selling bread at a single farmers market. Baking bread once a week has not given me enough opportunity to grow my customer base, gain experience successfully managing a business, or even hire a single employee. My goal of one day opening a brick and mortar establishment in my community has been delayed by this too. By only selling $25,000 a year worth of bread, I'm unable to earn the money necessary to fund my project. And because I'm prohibited from selling more, banks are hesitant to offer loans to a business without more revenue. Maryland's cottage food revenue cap is more restrictive than 37 other states. This restrictive revenue cap is an unnecessary measure and offers no additional safeguards to the public. Last year, Maryland Department of Health reported zero foodborne illnesses attributed to cottage food in their annual report. Cottage food businesses are only allowed to sell products that are non-hazardous and must be labeled in accordance with FDA requirements for disclosing allergens. By limiting cottage food revenues, local communities and farmers are adversely affected too. The revenue cap limits the amount of ingredients that I can purchase directly from local businesses and farmers throughout the year. Unfortunately, I am forced to plan how many markets I should skip each month to avoid reaching the revenue cap prematurely, which limits my community's access to nutritious bread. By supporting House Bill 178 to raise the $25,000 annual cap from, Mont from Cottage Food Law, you'd be helping make Maryland a great place to start or grow a business. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today, and I look forward to answering any questions the committee has. Thank you so much for doing business in Maryland and for being here today. Next, we have Mr. Santiago Suniga. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Santiago Zuniga, and I am a uh, senior at South River High School here in Edgewater, Maryland. For the last five months, I've been interning for Delegate Chen's office, specifically researching House Bill 0178, 
and comparing it to similar bills in other states. I have researched cottage tree laws here in Maryland and across the country. What I have found is that Maryland has among the strictest cottage tree laws in the nation. 82% of states have higher annual income caps for cottage tree businesses in Maryland. Furthermore, 60% of states have no annual income cap at all. For the states with higher annual income caps or no income caps, what is seen is that cottage tree businesses are allowed to thrive and fulfill their economic potential while supporting the communities around them. Meanwhile, Maryland is currently hindering the growth of these small businesses. Cottage tree businesses, local farmers, and consumers seeking a healthier lifestyle promoted by locally sourced, homemade food all benefit by increasing the annual income cap for cottage tree businesses. Additionally, as part of my research, I sought to address a major concern against the raising the income cap for cottage tree businesses. This concern relates to the potential for foodborne illnesses and allergic reactions. While this is a noble concern, there is no evidence that supports this belief. As a matter of fact, in states where cottage food laws are significantly less restrictive, I found no reported outbreaks of food il foodborne illnesses or reports of incidents regarding allergic reactions. No county, no county or state Department of Health website reports can reports any evidence that cottage foods lead to, lead to an uptick of illness or allergic reactions. Because cottage foods are subject to the same FDA labeling guidelines as commercial foods, there is no reason to believe cottage food is unsafe. Given this, I respectfully urge the support of this bill as it would grow the Maryland economy through small businesses and local farmers and promote a healthier lifestyle for cottage food consumers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Ms. Kimberly Haggard. Good afternoon. Is she here, Richard? No, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to Mr. Andrew, Andrew Roy. Mr. Roy? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, my name is Andrew Roy. Um, we began to bake bread using fresh local Maryland flour as a response to a need for local bread and organic food in our community. Uh, we were blessed the community rapidly embraced us and we quickly hit the $25,000 cap. This has affected our business in multiple ways. We currently have customers and additional farmers markets on our waiting list. Calculating this lost revenue last night uh, came to a total of about $50,000 of lost revenue due to the $25,000 cap on sales. This additional $50,000 would be enough for us to hire an entry-level baking assistant that we could pay a sustainable wage of $20 an hour to. Our goal is to take our bread business and grow it to a point where we can open a brick and mortar establishment. To do so, we would require a capital investment of somewhere between $100,000 and $250,000, depending on the condition of the property that we move into. Raising this cap would allow us to show a positive revenue stream and make financing the project obtainable. Finally, as, as in many other markets, the commodity price increases are drastically affecting our business. Over the past six months, we have noted a 23% increase in some of our basic staple products, including flour and salt. Raising the cap would help us continue to harbor small businesses in Maryland's small business friendly environment. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next um, we have Mr. Kevin Attix. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, and thank you to the sponsor for putting in a bill such as this. I'm Kevin Attix with Grow and Fortify, uh, an organization that builds and strengthens value-added agriculture and their businesses in Maryland. I'm here as an advocate and as a consumer of cottage foods. Um, you would probably not enjoy my baked goods um, because I'm not very good at it, but I certainly enjoy going to uh, local farmers markets and supporting uh, local cottage food industries. We believe that value-added agriculture which, by the way, is the conversion of farm products into something much more valuable. Uh, think grapes into wine, milk into ice cream, fruit into jellies or jams, or uh, those fruit trees into pick your own operations on farms through agritourism. We believe value-added agriculture is the future 
of farming and agriculture in Maryland. A report that we commissioned a number of years ago, which I'm happy to provide copies of uh, to your offices, uh, found that the value-added ag segment, which includes cottage foods, brings into Maryland's coffers a direct $875,000 annually and um, to uh, uh, in direct and indirect impacts over $20 billion when you add tourism and all the activities that go along with uh, value-added agriculture. Um, the bill simply allows an entrepreneur to invest in their businesses to produce and sell more locally produced, locally sourced ingredient and products. Frankly, there's no reasonable rationale for any cap, uh, but we understand uh, in incrementalism and moving from 25,000 to 100,000 would give these businesses a, a real opportunity to invest and grow and sell and be more profitable. Uh, so I ask for your support of HB 178. Thank you. Next we have Lisa Lastshot, and this is an unfavorable panel. I'm sorry, I can't get my, uh, my camera to work. It's okay, it happens. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice good Chair, afternoon. and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Lashot. I'm with the Maryland Conference of Environmental Health Directors, and this conference represents the local environmental health programs who regulate the food service facilities within the state of Maryland. The conference appreciates the intent of the bill, but is concerned about the public health significance of increasing the annual revenue this drastically. The original intent of the cottage food business um, law was to allow entrepreneurs to sell non potentially hazardous foods as an unregulated startup business. We feel by allowing the annual sales to increase from $25,000 to $100,000, we are well beyond the original startup intent. By quadrupling the annual sales and increasing the amount of food being produced out of a private home, there is an exponential increase in the risk for contamination and mishandling. Non-potentially hazardous food items represent a lower risk than potentially hazardous items, but not a zero risk. As demonstrated by the salmonella outbreak associated with peanut butter several years ago, contaminated non-potentially hazardous food items have the ability to cause illness and death. Physical, chemical, and biological contamination are also of concern to the conference. Contamination of food items by an ill food handler can spread illness such as norovirus to the patrons and consumers. Food can also be contaminated by physical hazards such as metal or, or hair and paint in the home and with hazardous chemicals from improperly maintained water wells, pesticides, and cleansers. In addition to these concerns, cross-contamination with allergens and improper labeling can cause anaphylactic reactions in those with allergies. The manner in which regulated food businesses are overseen prevents exposure to potentially unsafe food in contrast to the reactive complaint-based approach used by cottage food businesses in the state. Within regulated food businesses, risks are mitigated by food safety plans, labeling reviews, and allergen training, which are all required and verified through inspection. This process does not occur for cottage food businesses, thereby increasing risk to the consumers. Additionally, uh, with the sales of college cottage food in food stores, there is a risk of not having trace back in the event of uh, outbreak. So due to these concerns, we respectfully request the committee give House Bill 178 an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. We appreciate it. Are there any questions from the committee regarding House Bill 178? We have Delegate Krebs followed by Delegate Kurd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess this question is for the Environmental Health Director. Um, I'm not sure how long you've been around, but we, this committee has been dealing with cottage food issues for many, many years. And uh, I think we had un obviously unanimous consent that we wanted the industry to be successful. And we started with baby steps just to prove that it could work. But I don't think there, the original intent of the committee was you know, to, to stymie it. So the question I have for you, now that we've taken these baby steps with the $25,000, can you tell, tell me since we've had the cottage food industry been legalized in the state of Maryland, what has been the public health risk or what are the complaints that you've had? And how does that compare to the other states that have the very robust uh, cottage food industries that are, are light years ahead of us. Yes, delegate, and thank you for your question. As far as how long I've been in this business, I've been here for 18 years, and um, actually I started my career in food and community wellness within the state and um, had been around for many, many cottage food uh, bills and proposals that have went in. The issues that surround cottage food have to do with the fact that there's no regulation associated with the products and that non-potentially has 
hazardous food don't mean zero risk. So for instance, there are some food products like peanut butter who they don't have the water activity support growth, but nonetheless, there were contaminants. Um, the issues with juice, unpasteurized juice, there was an E. coli outbreak associated with that. Technically the acidity would meet that of, an un, of a non-potentially hazardous food, but yet it happened. So without any regulatory oversight, there is a concern that some of these food products have the potential to either support contamination and or growth. The problems that I have particularly seen, and I can speak to my jurisdiction, um, have been around labeling complaints. Um, and also we've had some criminal issues associated with cottage food. Um, our office periodically um, sees on community forums advertisements for cottage food businesses. And we have had to turn over THC sales um, in, in cottage food, as well as illegal liquor sales, people putting miniatures into cupcakes, that sort of thing. So there are some issues there as far as um, uh, with, with the regulatory oversight. Um, and, and what's going beyond the scope of what originally was allowed in cottage foods. So there is a problem with the education of the cottage food vendor in some areas, not understanding what the requirements are. And by not having a regulatory process for them to come to a health department, we can't reach out, out to everyone and have them understand um, what needs to occur in order to be in compliance and to go over some risk factors. I've done some research myself about cottage food in other states. And I think um, if we actually take a look at things, there are states that have good programs for requiring food safety training and requiring uh, licensure and or inspection that is a lot more proactive than our current state structure, which is reactive to a complaint based type of system. I Thank you. But I, I mean, the, the thing I was really looking for is actual data on the complaints and the health um, impacts of those complaints. If you can get that together for us, it will give us some real data and not just conjecture of what could occur. Uh, that would be helpful. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We have Delegate Kerr followed by Delegate Saab. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Addix, you work with many sectors of the, of the value-added agriculture and also where it intersects with the cottage food industry. So will these, uh, revenue limits um, have any effect on food safety labeling or regulation? And then as a second uh, question, do you have any idea about how this cottage food industry addresses the issue of, of food deserts and lack of access to, to healthy and fresh foods in some areas of our state? Thank you, Delegate, and, and I'll, I'll take the second question first. Um, we have seen a prolifer pro proliferation um, my words aren't with, with me today, proliferation of cottage food businesses in uh, many of our cities. And we receive calls regularly from folks who are um, part, part of the great transition right now of, of trying to figure out um, how they can do what they really love doing. And many of these folks are, are making products that, uh, or want to make products that fall directly under the cottage food regulations. And so we, we do see them addressing. I don't have any hard uh, data to show that, but it's, it's going to be part of our upcoming conference in December to discuss this because we see, um, just like we're seeing urban farms starting uh, more quickly and spreading faster than we've ever seen them before, especially in the last year and a half, we're seeing folks taking those farm products and turning them into uh, really great local cottage foods. In terms of the, the question about uh, raising of the cap, the raising of the cap um, has zero impact on uh, the, the regulations, uh, which are still uh, some of the strictest in the region. We know that because we've uh, spoken with the state health department in the last year about um, some of their unilateral decisions to remove uh, certain foods from the list of allowed foods, which are by the way allowed in other states, um, and and they're you know in terms of the scaling up, um, all of the same rules and requirements still apply. The regulations still apply. The labeling requirements uh, still apply. Something that that we think would be really really valuable to address some of the concerns of of uh, the opponents. Health officers should be creating and establishing uh, food safety training programs not just permits and inspections, um, but training programs, and not just for cottage food, but for commercial producers. All of the concerns that were raised about what could happen under uh, cottage food scaling up happen regularly 
at commercial uh, caterers, kitchens, restaurants. So it's, it's, um, there's nothing really different about the cottage food producer other than if you're trying to go get a loan and the most you're ever allowed to make is $25,000 to invest in a new piece of equipment or a facility, you're not going to get the loan. There's no way to grow right now. Thank you for yeah. that uh, complete answer. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. There's a witness that is here now, and I apologize just in the interest of fairness because she did sign up. Kathleen Flynn, are you here? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Committee Chair Pendergrass, Vice Chair Pena Melnick, and distinguished committee members, my name is Kathleen Flynn. Like the others, I'm a cottage food baker, and I would like to ask for your support for House Bill 178. The cottage food industry is an integral part of the local food system. Over the course of the pandemic, demand for cottage foods has only increased. As residents struggle to find food on the shelves of the grocery stores, they flock to their local farmers markets to bridge these growing gaps. Cottage food businesses have risen to this task, despite facing challenges like the rising costs of ingredients. Rising costs that I would like to note that we are hesitant to pass on to our customers who are our community, unlike chain stores. I started my cottage food business less than a year ago during the height of the pandemic. I'm grateful to say that the response has been great and a few months ago, I left my job to focus on growing my business. Like many others in the industry, my goal is to open a storefront in the community. However, the current revenue cap has made scaling my business incredibly challenging. With the increased interest in cottage food products, my estimated sales will hit the $25,000 revenue cap before the midway point in the year. Yet, with the associated cost of operating my business, I will not have made enough to save for a storefront, hire a single employee, or as the others have mentioned, convince a bank to give me a business loan. I'm not sure where to go from here under the current guidance. Increasing the revenue cap will allow cottage food bakers to continue to provide food security for their communities, create jobs, and demonstrate the financial responsibility and readiness necessary for commercial growth. For these reasons, I ask that you support House Bill 178 to increase the revenue cap. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony late today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Our pleasure, Delegate Sapp. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Delegate, for putting this, this bill forward. I think, you, and thank you for bringing a great panel to, to convince, you know, the people, the, some of us that may have not been convinced about the importance of the cottage um, food business. I'm a big supporter, and I think, uh, you know, I'm supportive of this bill also. I guess the question that I have is, and I was just looking at the fiscal note, um, why do we need uh, to hire a person at MDH uh, to, to administer the program is already if it's already in um, in motion. Why, why do we need to have the sixty thousand dollars expense? I guess just a fiscal note. If someone can clarify that for me, I would appreciate it. Thank you, delegates. Uh, that information, as you know, is prepared by Department of Legislative Services. So based on their analysis, they think that with the amount of increase in the um, cottage businesses, that would be out there that that would possibly be a additional measure that would be taken. But as seen from the fiscal note though, that it is a temporary increase and that it would actually decrease over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Saab. Next we have Delegate Shalega, followed by Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was uh, thinking the same thing as Delegate Saab, um, Delegate Chang, what do you think the fiscal note is just wrong? I mean, how, I was a little concerned. I, I looked through the program. I looked on the website. It was very easy to see what the qualifications are. Then I clicked on taking a class. They want you to take a class. It's, you know, like seven bucks and takes an hour and a half. It, it looks very reasonable. So when I read the fiscal note, 60,000 to hire a person, you know, what, how can you assure us that you, that you think that's too high? Again, that's an independent analysis from the Department of Legislative Services. I'm not quite sure how they came up with that amount, but I think that, again, that the initial cost to 
be able to implement the program. But I think if you look at the analysis that it actually decreases over the long term. Yeah, and it's not a licensed program. You, you just have to, to do what they say. I guess the only thing, I'm not sure what they're handling because it looks like complaints go to the local health department. So maybe they're handling the unique identifier issue. Um, looks like maybe the only thing the Department of Health would be handling is, do you think that's right? The unique identifier would be for the cottage businesses that would actually end up in the retail sector. So it's, we don't really have any data and I'm not sure how they came up with the analysis of how that amount was accrued and actually how many would actually enter the retail market. Yeah, it looks to me like the unique identifiers for people who don't want to put their home address on there because obviously they're making it in their home and you have to have an address and a phone number for people to report, you know, any if there's, you know, something wrong with with what they've purchased. So, um, yeah, I, I think you're right, Delegate Chang. I think that's too high. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Next, we have Delegate Hill, followed by Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for presenting and um, uh, uh, Delegate Chang for bringing this bill. Um, Mr. Lachelle, uh, Kevin Addix made some suggestions about how the Environmental Health Directors Conference could really help uh, support the industry and increase the safety of these. But it seems to me that the issues that you raised are not specific to cottage food and not necessarily specific to the amount of product being produced. So if I'm producing 12, you know, or I'm producing 20 or 200, the, my question to you is, when we're capping this based on revenue instead of number of units, are we, are we using the wrong thing because, uh, over a period of a few years, I can produce the same number of units and change my price to keep the revenue the same. But I'm, but from your standpoint, if it's a volume issue, my volume's gone. You know, my volume can go down for the same revenue. And, I, and I'm, I'm wondering if revenue is the right thing, and we should be, from your health standpoint, is the real issue the number of units? And and then I might have a follow up if it's okay, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate, for that question. Um, absolutely, the argument um, and opposition to this has to do with the increased probability of exposure um, to contaminated uh, food and or food with allergens. So the whole opposition is based upon an increase in the number of units uh, more than the actual amount of sales. But theoretically, if you're increasing the sales by four times, you also are increasing the number of units that are being put out there into the public. May I have a follow-up? Very quickly. Sure. So I, I guess what I would wonder is why the um, conference is not working with the cottage industry to come up with a better way. They do need to expand, um, but a better and safer way for them to, to do that that is not prohibitive to the goals of the industry and our goals to see them succeed. Yes, Delegate, I think that would be a wonderful um, opportunity to perhaps form a work group um, yeah. to meet dual goals. Or to meet with the sponsor and, and just work it out this, this session, maybe. Yes. All right, thank you. I will thank take that back you. to the conference. Thank you, Delegate Hill, for your questions. We have Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, delegates, for bringing this bill and the panel. Thank you. Um, it, I was reading the uh, Department of Health, their letter of information, and uh, Ms. LaShalt had mentioned it herself about other areas requiring registration or inspections or both. Uh, the Department of Health cited our sister states, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and District of Columbia, which all require both. However, after a little more research, they have no sales limits. So they are running those as virtual commercial kitchens. So my question to the cottage food growers or, or the cottage food business owners is would $100,000, 
if that would increase your productivity and you found that you could no longer do it in your kitchen, would that encourage you to go out then and start up commercial businesses? Whoever's best to answer that question. Uh, speaking for myself, uh, Delegate, yes, absolutely. Um, it would prove to myself, my, my customers, creditors, banks, um, that we have a viable product, that we have a, a business model that works, that we have a business model that can grow, and we would have the data to actually back that up and, and put us in a position where that next step is attainable. One follow-up, Madam Chairman? Sure, quickly, uh, as I told so Delegate you, Hill. So you do, um, so you do think that um, if you went commercial, uh, this would help with your banks getting loans to go commercial? A absolutely. Um, I know my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Roy, who's a cottage food baker, has actually approached banks and, and they were hoping to see revenue streams in the sixty to $80,000 range uh, in order to consider a loan necessary for uh, a business of our nature to do a build out, um, to take on a, a multi-year lease, um, to, to purchase the equipment that would be necessary. Um, so I, I think that $100,000 is a very reasonable compromise between where the unlimited uh, sales limits are in other states where they have perhaps more, more regulation and oversight with inspections um, and where we are, where we, we don't have that inspection um, necessarily here in Maryland, um, but giving us a, a sales limit that would let us have that demonstrated financial track record. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My pleasure. Are there any other questions for this bill hearing? I don't see any. Seeing none, this concludes the bill hearing on House Bill 178. It also concludes the hearings for today. I hope you have a blessed afternoon and thank you so much for your attention. Take good care. Bye-bye.